Well, I've always been a generalist. I uh, started working for the Highway Commission in the summers and then worked for the Kansas Highway Commission after I graduated. That's when I met uh, Dick when we uh, initially formed the Kansas City Omaha section of the Association of Engineering Geologists back about 45 years ago. And uh, then I uh, worked in research uh, for the Highway Commission. On, I got paid to be curious. I inspected dams for the Department of Agriculture. I went out and worked in the oil and gas industry for a short time. I uh, got back on the state uh, working in water rights. And my hobby has been an adjunct uh, professor. This is my 29th year at Washburn. And uh, I taught at Wichita State and Pratt Community College. So the students make me stay current. From some of the evidence of looking at the quality of coals in eastern Kansas, it appears that approximately one half mile of material has been removed off of uh, eastern Kansas. So it's been deposited possibly up through uh, Cretaceous times and then with the uplift, uh, uh, essentially half mile has been eroded away. And uh, once that material is eroded away, it's uh, carried downstream and then emptied out into the Gulf of Mexico. And at one time, the Gulf of Mexico had an embayment that extended as far north as Cairo, Illinois. So the material that's uh, eroded off the mid-continent is filled in that embayment all the way down to the present Gulf Coast. So uh, there's been a lot more of Kansas and Missouri here in the past, but it's, uh, it's gone. So we have to sort of uh, use the best evidence we have from other places and correlate back to Kansas and Missouri to uh, get an idea of what uh, went on during those time periods. So now if some of you have uh, some questions. Yes, sir. I've got one. Um, as you drive around Kansas City, Topeka, this general area around this general region, what are the top geological sites that we should be aware of or the most, most valuable geological sites? Well, some of the uh, nice ones were exposed along Interstate 70. Uh, here in uh, the Kansas City area, you have uh, most of the rock layers of the Kansas City Formation, uh, or group, I should say, Kansas City Group exposed. Uh, those layers do dip to the west, and further out in western Kansas, in some of the deep oil fields, uh, they do produce uh, oil and gas out of those zones. And perhaps you've noticed some of the uh, black shales that have been deposited around. Uh, they sort of weather out at the surface, sort of... Uh, dark gray in color and almost break into papery thin layers. Well, these are high organic shales. They didn't have enough organic material in them to uh, become coals, but out of the carbon that was in those layers, uh, when they're buried, heat and pressure would cook out the carbon and form oil and gas. So they are some of the uh, uh, producing horizon or uh, source rock horizons and uh, as you go further west. Uh, also, uh, some people are concerned about the black shales. Most of them have a uh, rather high radioactive uh, content. Uh, I knew one uh, geologist with Kansas Geological Survey. It turned out he was excavating a site for uh, a new house he was building in Lawrence and actually excavated into one of the black shales. Of course, everyone was concerned now, are, are you going to get radioactive products out of them? But unfortunately, well, I should say fortunately, those shales are so tight that the radioactive uh, gases and daughter products can't migrate out of them. They're trapped within the sh uh, shales. So you have more problems with uh, things like uh, radon uh, coming out of uh, some of the gravels with breakdown of uranium. So really, the black shales, you don't have to worry that much about here. But in western Kansas, there are great markers in the oil and gas industry for running radioactive logs and interpreting the strata out there. 
uh, in the uh, Manhattan area, the Tuttle Creek Spillway. Uh, it was badly eroded in the 93 flood with the massive amount of water that went through that. But the work with uh, the Kansas Geological Survey and uh, paleontologists worldwide, they have determined that the boundary between two, pardon me, boundary between two periods uh, occurs in the uh, spillway at Tuttle Creek in the Howe limestone. And uh, this limestone is actually the boundary between the Pennsylvanian and Permian periods. And now with correlation with the uh, layers in uh, the Perm Basin in Russia, uh, Tuttle Creek Spillway has been designated as the stratotype for the Pennsylvania and Permian boundary for the entire North America. Now that gets geologists excited, but not too many other people. But you can go up in the spillway at Tuttle Creek and collect some fossils that are loose on the surface or some of the rocks that are loose. They don't allow you to dig in the spillway. Dick mentioned the uh, ice over Kansas City area was probably uh, four or 500 feet thick. Uh, at Topeka, we just barely had the ice push across the Kansas River and was maybe 100 or 200 feet thick. But if you get back up to the northeast corner of uh, Kansas and uh, <clears throat> uh, right where the uh, states pretty well come together up there, probably the Continental Glacier was a thousand feet thick. And as you go on up to the center of the continental ice up in Canada, there your uh, thickness was probably around 10,000 feet thick. So the Ice basically build up this big pile that acts like uh, mountain ranges do today. It actually directed the uh, weather around itself and uh, drew in moisture and leached it out to continually build it up until the end of the ice ages. Uh, how, how could you? How can you estimate how thick it was in different areas like that? What what uh, what is it you look at that tells you that? in part uh, some of the deformation in the shales and limestones and how much pressure it would have taken to deform those layers. Uh, also, uh, Hudson Bay is the uh, largest epicontinental sea in North America. And uh, it's still there right now because the crust hasn't completely rebounded from being depressed by the great ice cap that was over that area. And as it rebounds, probably the uh, Hudson Bay will eventually be dry. And also, the area to the north side of the uh, Great Lakes is rising up faster with rebound than on the south side. So they're actually spilling the Great Lakes toward their southern shorelines. And uh, eventually, maybe we'll get the uh, Lake Michigan draining back into the Mississippi Basin like it used to. Is it going to take the silver carp with it? Uh, actually, the Himalaya Mountains distort the uh, movement of the uh, uh, air currents around the northern hemisphere. Well, when you had 10,000 feet of uh, glaciers, it also uh, did the same sort of distortion. And that brought uh, moisture, Pacific moisture down in across the southwestern United States. And that was dumped out there and get fed all the pluvial lakes that are in the desert basins that we see today. Now, that much weight of ice tends to grind up the rocks at the bottom and quite often literally reduces the rocks to flower size material. So if you see a white stream coming out of a glacier, this is carrying out that uh, glacial flower. And then as it uh, goes out away from the glacier, uh, the channels get filled up, the channels move back and forth over an alluvial surface, and then in periods when it'll dry out, then the winds will pick it up and blow it up out of the uh, river valleys and up onto the surfaces around it. So these vertical uh, lust bluffs you get right here in the Kansas City area, uh, used to be the Highway Commission tried to stand those up straight because they'd stand up that way and they wouldn't erode off. 
But then with the newer ideas about wanting to have vegetation on the slopes and making them all nice and pretty and covered with vegetation, which is a geologist, I think that uh, is, isn't the right idea. Let's have the nice rocks out there to see them. But the lust would build up layer by layer, and it has a vertical structure that allows water to migrate through it. And so it'll stand up, but once you lay it back, then you notice there's an awful lot of erosion to those slopes. You have to get them vegetated to preserve them then. And the lust makes fantastic uh, uh, agricultural land. The Lust area is out in western Kansas. These are our productive uh, fields out there. Now we got all uh, the irrigation water to them. And uh, also finer material is blown up and clays are carried further away than the uh, silt sized Lust. So as you get away from the Lust areas, then the soil starts getting tight because you have clays out in those areas. And it makes a tighter soil that you have to deal with. Yes, sir. I see the highway department has cut through rocky areas, and so we can see the strata through the ages. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I also see the uh, like the river bottom, like Missouri River bottom, the bluffs are two or three hundred feet high. And is that naturally water erosion? Uh, the yes, it is. The streams uh, removing the material. Mm -hmm. uh, when the glacial periods are in at their maximum. This last glacial period probably lowered sea level about 450 feet because that water was taken out of the oceans and locked up on the continents. <clears throat> so that allowed the streams to cut down to a lower base level. So right here under the Missouri River, under the uh, Kansas River, those streams cut down uh, very deep uh, valleys under the, the present valleys to match sea level, it was 450 feet lower. Then as sea level rose, then that led to more sediments filling in those deep cuts and bringing the level back up to above what we see today. And we're in erosional period now for the streams to be cutting back down into their alluvial valleys. I believe under one of the uh, bridges on the, uh, I can't remember which highway it is, or, had about 170 feet of alluvium underneath the uh, surface where they started building the bridge. So I, I see this strata thousands and thousands of years, and, and that's pretty comprehensible that it grew up or was deposited. And then there are also rocks on the surface which se just seem to be out of place. And could you describe some of those rocks or how they got there? Well, they call those erratics. Okay. And most of them in this, uh, swath of Missouri and Kansas were brought in by the glaciers. And that's why you can have the uh, giant boulders uh, that were carried along in the ice. And in some cases, those boulders were locked up at the bottom of the ice, and they'd actually left gouges in the bedrock that can be traced uh, at, to some of the giant boulders that uh, were dropped by the ice and preserved up the present time. And the humans particularly like the uh, pink quartzite boulders. So future geologists are going to have a hard time interpreting the edge of the ice uh, field because humans are taking this stuff out and using it for decorative purposes and hauling it all over the place. So uh, that and these little asphalt seams and uh, artificial uh, conglomerate seams that run all over the place we call roads. Just think what they're going to do to the poor geologists in a few thousands of years trying to interpret those deposits. I have lots of questions. <laughs> How about back in Pangaea, was it, yes. when all the continents were together in one landmass? Yes, that was the last supercontinent. Supercontinent. And were changes being made then, or, or formations? occurring then, that the continents broke apart and they were all carried away. Mm -hmm. That were what we see today is something that happened maybe back when it was all together. The uh, record in rock mm -hmm. and uh, continents are nice. They keep uh, the uh, things up above sea level where it's easier for us to study them. 
And really no place on the seafloor itself is the surface more than 250 million years in age. Because all the seafloors older than that have already been recycled. Now occasionally seafloors are, are trapped within the continents, so the continents are lighter. They float above the heavier mantle and they don't sink and get recycled. So this is how we can study these older rocks that are uh, trapped here on the continent. Now, how old do you think uh, uh, southern Kansas and southern Missouri are as far as compared to the age of the Earth? The granites that underlie these areas uh, were developed on the edge of uh, what became the North American continent about 1.4 to 1.5 billion years before the present. And then they got eroded off, they've been covered over, had more deposits laid down on top of them that were preserved and we can drill through and study. But uh, down in Woodson and Wilson counties in Kansas, we had volcanoes back about 90 million years ago during Cretaceous times that erupted so violently they actually ripped some of those primordial continental granites that formed North America and brought those up within the magma so we can actually find some of this ancient bedrock uh, granites in uh, boulders that are included in those volcanics down in those area. And we had some 4-H geology kids down there just a, a little over a week ago to, on a field trip where they'd actually collect native volcanic metamorphic rocks. This is a follow-up question on the erratics. Um, I never noticed that as a casual person. What what would you see? What would you what, what would you be looking for uh, if you're in a glaciated area? Uh, and, uh, like I mean, north of the river somewhere. Would you? Is there some place where you would see that? Uh, yes. Uh, quite often you'll see uh, from gravel size up to boulder size. These uh, uh, generally pink quartzites. They were river sands and have been metamorphosed into the quartzites. And if they have more iron in them, they may be purple. If they have uh, less oxidized iron within them, uh, they may be as pale as white. But their quartzite is very resistant to uh, breakage and grinding. So it uh, would actually last better than the other type rocks around it. So it gets left behind as a, re as a residual particularly as weathering removes the soil and gravels around them. Also, sometimes you can find uh, sort of grayish green rocks. And uh, these are referred to as green stones. And these were ocean pillow lavas that were formed uh, 3.8, 3.5 billion years ago up in what's now Canada, the formation of that area of Canada. And the glaciers also ripped those up and brought them down. So now you can find, a, call them a green stone, and generally if you break them open inside, then you can see the, uh, the black basalt uh, that hasn't been uh, altered by weathering to give it that uh, green shade. Yeah, usually it's unsorted. It's all kinds of sizes together. And those uh, quartzite uh, boulders come up from the uh, corner, northeast corner of Iowa, up into Minnesota, and up into the Dakotas. A, a few years ago, my wife and I went out to Cheyenne Bottoms, very surprised to find a huge wetlands in the middle of Kansas. Could you talk a little bit about the geology of Cheyenne Bottoms? Uh, that's been argued a great deal. <laughs> and apparently the, the Cheyenne Bottoms is in a uh, a structural sink, a declined area. And the most likely explanation for this is more soluble materials have been eroded out uh, from underneath that area by groundwater, and that's allowed this basin to form and develop. And it covered, probably it removed uh, uh, halite or salt that was deposited in the formations below that. But the strange part about it is the structure of Cheyenne Bottoms itself 
actually extends and includes much older rocks than the uh, rocks that have the evaporites in them. So we've never completely answered the question of how that formed. Had some, uh, a lot of interesting hypotheses, but uh, as the elderly lady in Missouri uh, said when uh, she was calling her husband hypothesis, and the pastor said, oh, your husband's George, why do you call him hypothesis? Well, he never works. So hypotheses are ideas that don't have all the information to call them a theory. How many of you are interested in Indian artifacts? The glacial material has also brought down catlinite. And catlinite is Indian pipestone. And some of the tribes up uh, in Minnesota and Iowa and in there had the rights to go into the state parks up there and still quarry the catlinite for their uh, ceremonial purposes. But you can actually find catlinite within uh, some of the glacial tills. Uh, it looks a lot like what people call jasper, but it's soft enough that you can scratch it with a uh, steel blade or a knife or a nail. But uh, glaciers are great. They brought all this outstandingly strange geology into this area for us to be able to study. And the glaciers didn't like just come down from the north. They started in different places and spread out from there? Yeah, depending on which way the ice would move. Some of it that uh, the ice uh, lobe might move out to the west and then circle around and come back to the east from that direction. Or uh, within the glacial material across uh, the northern part of north of across the United States in particular, they found uh, diamonds in the glacial material, very scattered, but by tracing them back and looking for uh, minerals that are related to diamonds in the pipes, they're able to uncover the uh, pipes up in Canada. And uh, instead of a volcano standing up, those soft uh, kimberlite pipes were eroded out by the glaciers. So here you have all these lakes up in the wilderness area that overlie these uh, glacial, uh, uh, these diamond-rich kimberlite pipes. <clears throat> so really they're going in and they're mining under these lakes for the diamond production. Wow. Where could we find a diamond, you say? <laughs> you can also go down in Arkansas and uh, try to find diamonds down there at the Crater of Diamonds State Park. You go in and pay your fee, and they have this uh, field out there that they plow up occasionally that is the weathered kimberlite material. And you can go out and dig for and sieve and try to find diamonds. Uh, Pat and I, we, we found sunburns while we were there. They're, they're very rare, but about the time we were leaving, they did uh, blow the uh, uh, siren saying someone had brought a diamond in to be identified in the... Uh, um, uh, headquarters of the museum area and you get to keep them. Now there's clays most everywhere. Uh, clays are a family of minerals and then we also use clay as a term for very small size particles. But the clays are actually related to uh, the mineral feldspar that you find in granites and a lot of the other igneous rocks. As those weather and break down, they change the structure, they incorporate uh, water into the structures, and you start getting the uh, clay minerals formed. And quite often the clays are very platy, and uh, particularly kaolinite is one of these that uh, the structures are fairly strong uh, horizontally, but then they're weak between and they take in an awful lot of water. Oh. And that can give you your shrinking and swelling clays that you may have trying to raise gardens in or uh, have problems with your house with the clays uh, moving. Uh, some of the real good clays, normally they don't settle out till the water is real, uh, real uh, has lost all its forward motion. So it has to be uh, still water for the particles to very slowly settle out because they're so small. 
And this might happen in an ocean basin at the margin of the oceans where you get clays laid down that later become shales. And you also get clay deposits in lakes. And uh, I do know of a case, uh, well, years ago, back in the 50s, there was a, uh, a little tussle between the uh, U.S. and France. So they started raising tariffs on things. And something they decided they could put a big tariff on, but it wouldn't mean much. It would be more figurative type thing was uh, clays for artistic use. Southwestern College down at Winfield uh, ran out of clay and they found out it, the, the tariff they would have to pay on it would be about 10 times the cost of the clay they normally imported <laughs> from France. So uh, the art department talked with one of the uh, geologists that was teaching at that time and he said, you know, I vaguely recall some mention of clay pits here on the property. So they went out on the back side or the, west, the east side of the campus and found some of these old clay pits. And these weathered uh, Permian shales actually were better quality clay than what they'd been importing from France. Weathered Permian, sh Permian shale. Permian shale. Does that mean that the, if I have this right, the swamp? When, can, when the area was a swamp, then it became shale, and then later that weathered into clay. Well, these were, clays were laid down at the uh, margin of the ocean when it was uh, hot, dry, and evaporating seawater. Oh. And these particular clays were laid down at the margin of that, compressed into shale, but now that they've come back to the surface and eroded, as they were eroding out, the quality of the clay was very good for artistic uses. Uh, they have been doing vertical fracking in the oil and gas industry by going down where the uh, drill hole went straight through the layers mm -hmm. and then they would frack those to allow the uh, oil and gas to come in easier. Mm -hmm. But the big change now, well it started that sort of fracking in Kansas in 1948. But this new change is where they've gone in and they developed the technology to steer the drilling in such a way that they can go vertically, then kick over in a curve, and actually go horizontal in thinner layers that hold oil and gas. Then they go in and put those under pressure that fractures the uh, rocks up, allows the oil and gas to move in, and they put in sand to help prop the stuff up. But uh, the life of those type of oil wells is shorter compared to most vertical wells because you're draining more of the formation in a short period of time instead of having it slowly migrate into a vertical uh, producing well. Now what they're saying with the, uh, the fluids from that, uh, some of them are nasty. For the most part, we don't have trouble in Kansas and Missouri with that because it's being done deep enough. Back east in shallower areas, they did have some problems with people who didn't obey the rules that mm -hmm. uh, this led to some of the contamination problems. Now, the fracking causing earthquakes. It's unlikely to do it in oil field fracking. Uh, it's the fluids that get injected the increased amount of salt water and other contaminated fluids they're pushing back in because they're producing so much more. Now this raises the hydraulic pressure down underneath there. If there's already a fault or something, it tends to lubricate it and make it more likely to move. So fracking itself, uh, normally won't be any effect of that in the mid-continent region. But from those fluids that they're trying to get rid of down the disposal wells, uh, this is just yep. particularly salt water and. Uh, pardon me. Do they bring it from the sea? How does it get to the mid? -continent? Well, that's trapped in the rocks down there, and it gets oh. produced along with the oil and gas. As that oh. comes up, you separate it out. You have the oil and gas you sell, and then you have to do something with salt water. 
Now they pump it down what they call them. They either let it flow freely down disposal wells, or if they got a whole lot of it and they're in a big hurry, then they pump it down. Now the pumping increases the pressure and causes these problems we think are leading to the earthquakes. Do you, do you think that they're going to have any earthquakes uh, where they're doing the fracking, uh, the most fracking today? Well, that's in Oklahoma right now. It is? They okay. jumped from, what, uh, three earthquakes, three or four earthquakes over a uh, 4.0 Richter magnitude in about 10 years. Now they're talking about two or three hundred a year. Two to three hundred. Yeah. Between cigarette yeah. smoking and cancer? Yeah, yeah the, the oil industry's hired the same guy. lawyers from the <laughs> tobacco industry. Would you like to make some comments about the okay. fossils on the top? Yeah, th this one, I drool over that. This is one of the saber-toothed cats. I'm not for sure if this is the most recent one. Uh, I hate to handle it in case I drop it. But uh, saber-tooth uh, varieties of cats have uh, come and gone uh, over the ages. Uh, they even have some of the uh, predecessor uh, creatures to the cats that developed uh, this type of saber. And basically, these aren't like our modern biting cats that have smaller, stronger teeth that they're able to take on and bite into. They don't like to, but they can bite into bone and do quite a bit of damage that way. Uh, like the lions, well, they don't try to bite through somebody's spine. That will wipe out their teeth. So they go in and try to go for the throat to choke them down or cause loss of blood. Now, the saber-toothed cats, generally they have sort of serrations along the uh, back side of the uh, saber, and it's also more knife-like. So they're more of an animal that would go in and take down their prey by attacking and uh, ripping into the flanks or the belly of their prey and taking them down by loss of blood and shock. Uh, there have been cases of Smilodont in which they've, that's one of the most recent of the saber-toothed cats, that they find an, elder, an elderly animal's fossil that the broken sabers have possibly healed somewhat and been rounded off by use. So we think they lived in prides like lions do, and the other members of the pride would be bringing in prey and the elder statesman, shall we say, uh, was able to survive that way. There's also the dirt tooth cats. They have a smaller uh, knife-like tooth. And uh, they, again, they're more of a flank and belly attacker uh, than they are trying to go for the front end, the throat, or uh, areas where there might be large bones. And uh, this particular one, I've tried to collect some of these out in western Kansas. This is a cephalopod. And you're probably uh, aware of the uh, cephalopods today that we have, uh, like the, uh, the squids, the uh, octopus, octopi. Uh, and uh, these would have these uh, fancy shells this way. Uh, the only curl, the only shell coiled cephalopod we have today are the uh, nautilus. And you see the nice nautilus shell they get from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean that they use in decorative purposes. Uh, this character would start coiled out, then they would uh, start straightening out, and then start curling back. And I believe these are scapulites. So here the animal would be up here with these squid-like tentacles and these water jet uh, to move around. And I think maybe this is a modification to get the center of gravity closer in uh, so they're more maneuverable. Some of the straight cephalopods may have find evidence of some of them up to 18 feet long. So if they're that straight, it's difficult to steer. Ammonites? 
Yes, that's the, the first ones of those were the uh, Nautilus that had the most simple shell. And they're the ones that have straight partitions uh, between the uh, uh, where the animals grown and moved forward, built more shell, and then sealed off the back. But they also have a siphuncal, a tube that goes all the way back to this initial chamber that they built back here. And they can use that to adjust their buoyancy yes. by moving salt water back into the different segments, moving gas in and out, and they can change their balance. But if they're a nice, even coil, then the center of gravity is real close into their tentacles and makes them much more uh, agile, being able to basically turn on a dime. And then with the tentacles, uh, some evidence of some of the uh, ancient uh, cephalopods that they may have had uh, 20 to 30 foot tentacles. Modern ones, of course, have much shorter ones until you get into the big squids. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you.